So uh, welcome everybody for the webinar of today. The talk of, uh, of the webinar is review of computational elasticity of turbo machines. And uh, that's the second part of a talk uh, uh, given by uh, Mehdi Badati, uh, who gave his first talk in November. And that's the second, the second part of the same talk. Um, as usual, I introduce the speaker and then I give him the stage. So uh, Mehdi Vadati is the principal research uh, fellow of the thermal fluid division. He has over 30 years of experience in developing numerical methods, uh, numerical models for aerodynamics and aeroelasticity. Prior to his current position, he led the uh, aeroelasticity group at Rolls-Royce Vibration University Technology Center, VUTC, at Imperial College. During this time, his group developed the aerodynamics and aerodynamicity code AU3D, uh, which is used at all uh, Rolls Royce sites, uh, UK, USA, Germany, and India, and the only code for aerodynamicity uh, analysis. Every Rolls Royce engine, engine uh, since the late uh, 1990s has utilized this code during its development. Uh, including the entire trend uh, engine family, this has led to a considerable savings for Rolls Royce. He was awarded the position of Rolls Royce Research Fellow uh, in uh, uh, Imperial College, first person to receive this award uh, for his service to the company. Uh, he has been a partner in major UK European turbo sharing projects. His research topics include uh, development of CFD algorithm for internal and external flows, development of numerical elasticity, FSI uh, models, uh, aerodynamic uh, modeling of gas turbine components, uh, fan, compressor, turbine, and uh, seals, um, uh, turbulence modeling using uh, machine learning, applications of machine learning in turbo machinery, aerodynamic and acoustics modeling of drones, UAVs, uh, aeroelastic behavior in uh, wind turbine. It's with uh, great pleasure that I introduced uh, Mehdi Badati for the webinar of today. So Mehdi, I stop sharing my screen and I let you share yours. I think you need to reshare it. Thanks, Francesco, for your invite, for your introduction. Let me see whether is share. And there we go. We see your screen. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Just move the names out of my screen. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to my presentation today, which is about uh, computational air elasticity of turbo machines. Uh, this is the part two of the presentation. And the initial one was on Flutter part one. The second part would be on buffeting and force response. And I'm gonna explain, uh, just give a brief introduction of the first part of the presentation as well. Just to add that I think the title says Turbo Machines, but it really is fan blades because uh, first part of this presentation concerned the flutter vibration of fan blades. And this part would be again, most of the issues that I'm going to be talking about would be about the fan blades, as you can see here. And the reason I'm concentrating mostly on fan blades is, first of all, fan blades are probably the most important, if not the important part, part of a turbo machine, especially on an aero engine, as they uh, deliver about 80% of the thrust. And with the move to go into bigger bypass ratio engines, this um, uh, the ratio gets even higher. So you are expecting around 95%, 90% of the thrust coming from the fan. And the other reason that fan is important, even if you move to an electric engine and replace the rest of the turbo machine with the electric motor, you still need some form of fan or propeller to tear and to drive it, unless if there is a new technology. So uh, uh, today, uh, all the aeroelastic phenomena I'll be talking about is for the fan blades, but some of them translate to other form of the other components such as compressor and turbine. 
uh, I started my presentation by showing because they scored computation or uh, show the real event of a vortex injection uh, injection by the engine and how does CFD model it. So uh, I would be showing the effect of this sort of phenomena on fan stability in terms of both aerodynamic and aeroelastic later in this presentation. So, uh, so the outline of the presentation today is uh, I'm going to recap of the first lecture on flutter and just give a quick introduction what's aeroelasticity. So it should not take long. Uh, this is a, uh, should not take long. So I try to finish the first lecture quickly, which would contain the bits about flutter and also computational aeroelastic model used in this board. Then I try to describe the theory of aeroelastic vibration using 2D aerofoils. And in particular, two areas that today I'm going to cover would be application based on interaction of unsteady flow and vibration. And in that subject, I will be looking at the effect of unsteady flow at the tip and also buffeting due to bird strike. So first, I'll uh, try to cover the effects of unsteady flow and vibration. And in the second part, uh, the application would be fan operation with distortion. And I will try to explain how does that create vibration on the fan blade and also look at other aspects when you have distortion. And fan blade, just before going, why would we get distortion on a fan blade? So usually fan blades get uh, experience distortion during crosswind when they're sitting stationary in the airport and also during the takeoff due to angle of attack of the aircraft. Also, some of the new modern engines, uh, such as boundary layer ingestion uh, fans, would experience distortion all the way through the flight due to their design. So I try to explain all, uh, go through this, all three of these. So going to, uh, to the previous uh, lecture, so what is aeroelasticity? And as I mentioned last time, it's also referred to as fluid solid interaction. And it represents the interaction between inertia, Sorry, I need to get my laser, I keep on forgetting. Okay, it represents the interaction between the inertia and the elastic and aerodynamic forces. So if you look at the equations, as I said, mentioned before, it's just like a damped harmonic motion with a forcing term and the forcing term here comes from aerodynamics. And the different way that this unsteady force is created, uh, we give the phenomena different names. And I think I'll go through, to, in the, today's presentation, I will show you uh, what do I mean by flutter, buffeting, and also force vibration. So numerically, in order to be able to solve, you need to be able to solve these equations. And you can see this is a very hard differential equation and it's highly nonlinear because you can see that the aerodynamic forces are function of the displacement X, the uh, uh, velocity of displacement and time. So, The other thing that sometimes people uh, try to describe aeroelasticity is how does a solid, solid body react to forces acting on it and how does the flow change in response? And then how the solid, so this, as you can see, is looking at the equation, this is really, we are trying to model that. And And I showed the video last time that we have a, a wing sitting in a free stream. As you start blowing the air, you, uh, due to the interaction of the elastic forces and the aerodynamic forces, 
you start getting a vibration going on. So this is a typical uh, example of an aeroelastic vibration. So this is the last slide, I think, just to explain to you how do we solve that equation. As you notice, the last equation was highly nonlinear. And if you want to solve it in one go, it would, you have to solve uh, Fe on the, for the left-hand side term. And on the right-hand side term, you need to somehow get the fluid forcing. And if you imagine the fluid forces are going to come from CFT. And so the computations become very expensive and usually you cannot solve that problem for that equations for many real problems. So the way we do turbo machinery is we calculate the elastic terms beforehand using an FE code. So here is the damping and the modes of vibration. And then we interpolate all of them on the CFD grid. And after that, we do not look with the, to the FE anymore. Everything done within the CFD code. And this is called a partially coupled because aerodynamics can see the fluid, the mechanical vibration, but the mechanical vibration, i.e. the FE, cannot see the CFD. And so we start from, we solve for pressure P in the CFD simulation every time step, then we solve for the displacement. According to the displacement, we move the mesh, and then we do another CFD simulation to the next time step to get another unsteady pressure, and this simulation go on. So this is just for completeness, just how to show you how we solve them. So I'll start now going through the problems, and Last time, <coughs> uh, I explained the phenomena that we call flutter for fan blades. And uh, I try to explain the elements of fan stall flutter. So if we try to, uh, if we look at the compressor map for this uh, fan blade, so we got mass flow on the X axis and we got pressure ratio on the Y axis. And here we got constant operating line. So this represents that operation of the fan at each speed. So for example, this is speed A, speed B, speed C, and this is increasing speed. And also according to the downstream geometry of the fan, you get a, or the nozzle that you place downstream of the fan, you get a working line. And this is what the engine should supposed to operate on as you throttle and go forward. It's supposed to work on the <coughs> working line. However, uh, sometimes this working line due to natural wear and tear or other uh, situation can move a bit towards the stall line. And here is the stability boundary shown by the stall line. And before you reach the stall line, in some scenarios, the limit of stability of the fan is not the stall boundary, but it's flutter. So in some certain uh, speed, before you reach a stall line, the fan starts uh, vibrating and you lose a, a fair bit of stability of the fan, which is called flutter bite. So you can see that you have, by having flutter, you remove a range of stability of the fan operation. And our work has shown that there are three main elements to fan stall flutter. One is the nature of flow on the suction side. And we found out that when we reach this flutter boundary, we start getting three dimensional radial migration. The second one is the shape of the mode shape, the shape of vibration. So trying to explain, these are the contours of displacement here. And the red is high displacement. And then you get, as the color changes, you got less displacement. So if you look at, for example, the shape of this displacement around the tip of the blade, you can see you got higher displacement at the leading edge than the trailing edge. So in a way, the vibration is a mixture of a flapping and a torsional mode. So, that's another element of stall flutter. And finally, one of the most important uh, findings that we've done in our work, that one thing that really drives the stall flutter 
is the acoustic of the intake. So these are the main three elements of the stall flutter. And the reason the acoustic of intake is important, as I think I described last time, is because the blade vibration uh, creates a pressure wave and the pre Sorry, uh, the blade vibration creates a pressure wave and this pressure wave would propagate both upstream and downstream, but we are more interested in the pressure waves which travels upstream. And as it travels upstream inside the intake duct and reaches the high light due to the change of impedance, some of the pressure wave would propagate outside and some of that would reflect and come back towards the fan blade. And depending on the phasing that this pressure wave comes back to the fan blade, that pressure wave can be stabilizing or destabilizing, depending whether the return pressure waves is in the phase with vibration or out of phase with vibration. And I'll try to explain the flutter in terms of a simple aerofoil. So if you've got a one degree of uh, freedom aerofoil here with a plunging degree of freedom. So you got a stiffness of X and a damping of C. So you got air flowing over the aerofoil. So it's a lifting device, so it would have lift. Now, so if you give the blade or the aerofoil slight displacement about its equilibrium position, then you create an unsteady lift, delta L, which is gonna be for a plunging mode, would be a function of time and the velocity of the blade. And the reason is the function of velocity of the blade is that the effective angle of attack to the blade as it's plunging up and down. So this is just a one degree of freedom plunging. So the blade is just going up and down. Is the angle of attack to the blade, uh, the effective angle of attack to the blade changes. So U is the main flow. X dot is the effect is the velocity of the blade. So you can see the effective angle of attack would be U rel, which is a function of X dot. So consequently, you would create a unsteady lift on the blade, which is a function of time and X dot. And so the, your equation of motion, as I showed in the first slide, would be of this form, and you can just easily show that the blade will flutter if the delta L is in phase with X dot. And for a simple one degree of freedom plunging motion, you can easily show that this blade would only flutter, this system would only flutter if the blade is operating on the stall part of the incidence versus lift curve. The other way that the blade flutter was due to the fact that if you have a sound source here and you send it to an object in the green and then it's going to reflect and come back to the uh, sound source again and here if we uh, our sound source would be the blade vibration so you can imagine that blade vibration create a blade vibration it creates a pressure wave which propagate here you can think of it to be the intake duct it reaches the highlight, then it reflects and comes back to the blade. And you can imagine that if it reaches the blade in phase with the vibration, we try to increase the vibration. And if it comes out of phase with the vibration, you try to damp out the motion. So that's the reason that intake is quite an important effect on a fan flutter. So this sort of was a very quick summary of the first lecture. Sorry, I've gone too, might have gone a bit too fast, but I thought I'd just try to explain what flutter is because we are moving to explain new things. <clears throat> One important thing about flutter is, I'll try to emphasize that, the only unsteadiness in the flow comes due to the blade vibration. So the air can be completely steady. If you design your mechanical vibration or the intake, badly, then you're going to have flutter. So the, the, you can have the nicest flow on the blade, but with a bad mechanical uh, mode shape 
and a bad design of intake. You can have flutter. So the only form of unsteadiness in flutter comes from blade vibration. That is according to the definition I use. So the next we look at the interaction of unsteady flow and the blade mode. So here the flow for some reason in this sort of type of aeroelastic excitation, for some reason, the flow becomes unsteady. So I'll give you an example. So we have the, here we got flow past an aerofoil like that. Again, we have a one degree of freedom lifting and the, the, the only degree of freedom is lifting in the X direction, which is normal to the blade. So, sorry about this. I need to change the laser to automatic to be able to play the video. So now what happens now? The four cases that shock is sufficiently strong, then you're gonna get the situation that the shock does not stay steady on the blade. So you're gonna have a motion of the shock up and down the blade or the aerofold. And consequently, because the shock is moving, the forces on the blade changes, yeah? Because the lift is a function of the steady, uh, the instantaneous solution on the blade. And since the, as the shock is moving, it creates an unsteady force on the blade or unsteady lift. So here, we, the equations of motion becomes of this form. And so you have a lift, which is a function of time due to the shock motion. So the difference here is you do not need the blade motion here to create unsteadiness. The unsteadiness is already inherent in the flow, which is due to the strong interaction interaction of a very strong shock with the boundary layer. Consequently, L, you have an equation of motion of that form. And if you consider that the natural frequency of this uh, aerofoil is given omega, is given by square root of K over M, where M is the mass and K is the stiffness. And this lift, which if we then take this Fourier harmonics of the form of C and E to the I omega and T. So we can see that when one of the components here has the, of the harmonics of the lift that you create on the blade has got same frequency as the natural frequency of the blade, the system would be at resonance because this becomes an equation at resonance. And when you are at resonance, the only thing which determines the, your response level would be damping. So you can see that for this situation, the unsteady forcing drives the blade. And when the fre one frequency or one of the frequencies of the unsteady forcing is same as the natural frequency of the blade, you are at resonance and you can get high response level as is shown here. So this is the frequency and the response. And the only thing which controls the amplitude of the vibration is damping. So this is a classic case of buffeting which can happen on the wings. And on the classical fan blades, uh, on the fan blades, this can happen, but this is a typical design for very high pressure ratio fan blades that you have such a strong shock. And this type of vibration driven by the shock on the fan blades usually happens either on military fans or the other time that you might see such a situation is at high altitude where the flow can stay virtually laminar all the way to the shock and consequently the shock can move. So this is not a typical uh, of modern civil fans. So the way that civil fans can uh, experience vibration is due to the unsteadiness at the tip. So you can see here, these are fan blades and you got air flowing and this is the tip leakage vortex. <clears throat> the tip leakage vortex 
uh, is a free sh free shear as it uh, travels through the passage. It, depending on the operating line of the fan blade, whether it's near stall or weight stall, it breaks down. And then, because it breaks down, you would have a very broadband frequency, which is due to this uh, vortex breakdown. In fact, here I've shown that you would have many frequency and this is completely, is, this is, well, this is, uh, shows that, that this sort of uh, incoherent structure you can break it using some form of decomposition. You can uh, form it to different modes, but that's irrelevant to this presentation, sorry. So you have this unsteadiness, which has got a broadband of frequencies, but if you start vibrating the blade or cause vibration of the blade, then what happens is that these unsteady features start locking in to the vibration and consequently only respond at the frequency of vibration. So this phenomenon is called locking that by blade moving, the unsteady flow tends to lock into the vibration of the blade and respond according to the vibration of the blade. And consequently, that this situation, you've got unsteady forcing, which is in phase with the vibration of the blade. And so you can expect quite a large response levels. So when does it happen for the fan blade? So again, if you look at the compressor map uh, for the fan blade, and this is your working line, this was your previous uh, flutter byte, this type of instability for the fan blades is not as serious as the flutter bite that I showed earlier because it tends to occur much closer to the stall boundary. In fact, uh, our work has shown, or people's work has shown that this sort of unsteadiness, which becomes like that, if you look at it in, in this view, happens when the slope of the constant speed characteristic becomes zero. So you reach in near the stall level and then you start getting this type of vibration. So again, I say that uh, if you look at this constant speed characteristic, you can expect normal acoustic or intake driven flutter at that sort of condition around here, but your stall flutter tends to happen much closer to the stall, sorry, this sort of tip driven instability vibration tends to happen much closer to the stall line. So again, this sort of flutter is more dominant and more worrying for the manufacturers. So, just give you a demonstration of tip instability in the plate. So we have this uh, mass flow versus pressure ratio. And on this, I have the uh, measured data, which is the red line. And we got the steady state characteristic. Well, I think let's don't go to that. I think the black lines are uh, CFD calculated uh, operating point for the fan. And you can see that as we push the fan towards the stall, the operating point is not really an operating point and it becomes an operating orbit. This is due to the fact that at this sort of condition, the flow in the fan domain genuinely becomes unsteady. And if we now take a cut through the fan blade and look at the operation of the fan, we get this sort of, these are very similar to the uh, tip vortices that I show earlier on in the first, tip leakage vortices I showed in the first slide. But when you got a whole assembly of 300 uh, plates, this would stay, would not stay in the same place and they would tend to rotate circumferentially. And because they rotate circumferentially, at a certain speed, and you got a certain number of features, they create an unsteady forcing on the blade. And 
this is what it would look on an engine test. So now here you got a fan blade. This is a result of a actual measurement. And you got a fan blade here and you try to push it towards stall. So this is a rig test that done. And we start from here and we start throttling the uh, fan blade to push it towards the stall. Here I've got both measure data and CFT data just to show you the unsteadiness for the CFT data. But everything else here on this plot is measure data. And we have a Q light here just upstream of the fan blade at the leading edge. So what happens that initially the looking at the signature of the Q light, initially it's very quiet. And if you take the Fourier uh, harmonics of this, you can just see the blade passing. So that's the only thing you are measuring. <clears throat> As you approach the zero slope and the flow becomes unsteady and sh shows features that I showed in the previous slide, you can see that the signal become uh, the signal at the Q light starts growing. And moreover, if you get to take the Fourier harmonics of it, you can see you start getting other frequencies which are below the blade passing. And these sort of represent themselves as sort of rotating instability or rotating stall going around the circumference. It's not really a rotating stall because it's, the blade is not really stalled. It's some form of rotating unsteadiness going around. So you get other uh, frequencies which are below the blade passing. And in this situation, you can see that some of this unsteady pressure on the blade would interact with the blade vibration. So this plot is the strain gauge on the fan blade. And you can see initially it's quite quiet. And then you start getting this uh, vibration due to the interaction of the unsteadiness due to the rotating uh, unsteadiness around the circumference interacting with the vibration of the blade. So this is another way that you get a vibration of the blade, but this sort of vibration, as I said, it happens much further than the store, the parse band, parse speed uh, flutter, which is sort of intake driven. <clears throat> I think one of the main reasons that usually engine manufacturers are worried about this sort of unsteadiness is noise rather than vibration. So the, the difference here again to emphasize on it that for flutter, the only source of unsteadiness what was the blade vibration. But, but for this type of unsteadiness uh, vibration, the unsteadiness is already in the flow. So the flow has unsteadiness and the unsteadiness would have a range of frequencies. And if one of those frequencies is sufficiently close to one of the blade's natural frequencies, then you would be at resonance and you get vibration. Uh, so I think we passed this one. The other way time that you can get uh, unsteady driven or buffeting, uh, whatever name is given to it, uh, vibration is when you got foreign object damage or in this case, uh, bear strike. Because this is how the engine or the fan blades would look after the bear strike if the air was not flowing through them. Because a well-designed fan blade should be able to take the impact of a, a bear without completely falling apart, unless if the bear is very big. For a, a, a kilogram bear, the, in, the fan blade should be able to handle the impact of the fan a bird hitting it without any significant uh, operation to the fan. So 
here we are going to look that what happens after the bear strike in terms of aerodynamics and uh, aeromechanics. So you can see that the bear strike for this case has dented the plate and you have created a cup at the leading edge of this plate and this plate. And we try to analyze what happens in terms of flow for this configuration. And this is what we have modeled in the CFT. So to make it a bit simpler for us, we have got a heavily damaged blade, only a heavy a blade here, which is damaged. The computation is for a 360 degree configuration. Well, I've just shown this sector. And if now we look at, take a cross section cut around 90% height, so it would be around here and look at the stored region within the passages of the fan blade, we can see that all the, you can see the arrow folds here. <clears throat> you can see that this is the damaged blade here and this is the trailing blade. So the blade is, uh, the fan is rotating down the page. So this is the damaged blade, this is the trailing blade. You can see due to the high angle of attack that the fan blade, which has been struck by the fan, by the bear experiences, you tend to stall this passage. And this passage stall remains very local. This is quite dependent on the size of the bear. So if you had a bigger bear, this might stall region might have affected two passages. And if your bear is sufficiently big, it affects the whole thing. So for this case where the, we were trying to understand is uh, the bird is sufficiently small and the stall region only stays within the passage of the bear strike blade or the damaged blade and the trailing blade. And what we found, uh, you found out that obviously such a stall region, I mean, first of all, it's very hard for CFT to predict. So the frequencies and the nature might not be exactly correct. But what we found out that what happens is you get this unsteady in this, in this passage. This is more qualitative than quantitative. Yeah? You have an unsteady flow in the passage between the damaged blade and the trailing blade. And what you can notice that the most of the unsteadiness is not on the damaged blade, but is on the blade which is trailing the damaged blade. So consequently, because this unsteadiness, you've got unsteadiness on the trailing blade, you create unsteady forcing on the blade. And this unsteady forcing can have many frequencies. And we found out this is now we're looking at the forcing amplitude for two different modes on the trailing blade. So we are looking at the torsional mode, which is the red, the, the green one, and a flapping mode. And we found out that these are the amplitude of just, the, sorry, this is again becoming a bit confusing. Let's forget the red one, just consider the green bars. And we are looking at the amplitude of the forcing on different blades. So blade zero is the damage blade. Blade one is the blade trailing the damage blade. And blade two is blade, two blades that, uh, trailing and so on. <clears throat> and if we look at this plot, we can see that even though Blade zero is damaged. The one which sees the highest forcing is not the damaged blade, but the blade trailing it, this blade, blade one. And consequently, it creates a lot of unsteady forcing on the blade. And you can see now, if you take a Fourier harmonic of the unsteady forcing, which is created on the trailing blade, now we have plotted the frequency against the frequency components of the unsteady forcing on the trailing blade, you can see that it's got a frequency which is very close to one of the natural frequencies of the blade, which in this case is the first torsional mode. And consequently, 
this plate, this sort of would lock into this mode, as I showed before, that if the frequency of vibration is sufficiently close to the frequency of unsteadiness, the frequency of unsteadiness locks into the frequency of the vibration. And consequently, you have some form of resonance and you would get very large amplitude uh, vibration of the trailing blade. In fact, this was a case which was tested. This is actually was used to understand why was it that the blade which was struck by the bear didn't come off, but the blade trailing it can come off. So even though this is a very difficult problem for CFT to solve, but it quantitatively can show why in such scenarios, it's not the damage blade which comes out, but the blade which is trailing the damage blade which comes off. So obviously if the pair becomes bigger, as I mentioned, as I mentioned, uh, that for the smaller pair, the, the, uh, the stall cell, sits within one passage. But when the bird becomes bigger and the size of damage becomes bigger, you can see that this uh, uh, stall cell starts traveling around the circumference. So you see this damage blade keeps on creating stall, which now starts moving around the circumference. And obviously if this stall cell travel be, is able, be able to travel all the way around the circumference and reaches where the original stall blade is generated, the fan blade would serve. And this is the video. You can see the bird is eaten. And, and you can see it's dark. Uh, so this is, this engine has now serves is due to the fact that I think the bird must have been big enough and the stall cell that you create it goes all the way around the circumference and reaches where the bear strike was done and consequently the engine surges. Uh, another, so this was interaction of unsteady aerodynamics with vibration. Uh, the other way that you get vibration is forced vibration. And this is usually driven due to your input signal or your flow or for external aerodynamics, they call it gust response. So in this situation, your velocity, uh, your, mm, sorry. In this uh, case, the, your inflow condition is not, or your outflow condition is not uniform. Sorry. Okay, in this condition, your U, your inlet condition, as a matter of example, uh, is not uh, constant. So U is a function of time, as you can see, it's got this variation. So consequently, your lift would be a function of time. And again, if uh, your U of T, you take its Fourier harmonics, and in the case that one of the Fourier harmonics matches one of the frequencies of the natural frequencies of the vibration, you are at resonance. And again, you, you expect very high response level. So when does it happen in the components of turbo machinery? I mean, one of the classic cases that this happens in turbo machinery is rotor stator interaction. So you can see that as the rotors go past uh, stator veins, and this uh, begin to uh, experience unsteady forcing, which would be for the rotors would be frequency of, uh, of rotation times the number of stator veins. And for the stators would be frequency of the rotation times the number of the rotor blades. So the uh, stators 
excite the fam, uh, create unsteady forcing on the rotors due to the wake interaction in this plot. And uh, in this plot, the rotors excite the upstream stator due to this potential effects. Obviously, there would be stators here, and then the stators now would excite the rotor due to potential effects. And how do we analyze it? This is one of the standard cases that, or standard aeroelastic analysis that engine manufacturers do, and they use Campbell diagram to find out whether there is any force vibration on the, uh, the component they are interested in. So the way the Campbell diagram works, you got the shaft speed as the x-axis, the frequency of the shaft speed as the x-axis, and you got frequency, you got shaft speed as the x-axis, and you got frequency on the y-axis, and on this, you start putting the engine order line. So each engine order means speed of rotation. So you can see for one engine order is one times rotation speed, two engine order, three and five engine order, and so on. And these define the frequency of the forcing. So for example, if you got here, you have five stator wings, the rotors would see a five engine order excitation frequency. <clears throat> or if you had 10 stator wings here, the rotors would see a 10 engine order excitation frequency. So what happens then? On it, they start putting the lines of natural frequency. So this is the frequency of the first natural mode, second mode, third mode. And when you get the crossing between the forcing frequency and the mode frequency, you are at resonance. So he, here I have put all the resonances in this uh, system here. So you can see you got the resonance here, here, here. The way you cannot obviously uh, avoid all the resonances because you would have the uh, blade frequencies and you, your, your uh, turbo machine different at a wide range of speed. So you always have crossing. But one thing you try to avoid is two things you try to avoid actually. The first thing is <clears throat> you can live with this uh, yellow crossings, but you don't want to have a crossing which is near design speed because the fan blade would be sitting or any other component of the turbo machine would be sitting on the uh, operating at this condition. So you would have a lot of vibration at design. So it would uh, reduce the life of the fan blade. The other thing that you, you try to avoid is to make sure that the one engine or the line never crosses the first flap mode because this way you would have very high uh, response level. So you would always have force response, but you would always try to avoid force response at design speed. And the other thing we try to avoid that the one engine or the line never crosses the first mode. So how does a fan blade experience force response? And and here is the situation where we have a fan blade and we have a crosswind coming. And you can see that as the crosswind comes, uh, here the crosswind would be from this direction. You get the ground vortex and the ground vortex Goes, uh, gets sucked in by the fan blade. This is the first slide that I showed it. And moreover, if the crosswind is high enough, then you're gonna get a separation on the lip of the intake. So you got sources of unsteadiness. You got uh, the fan blade, as it goes around the circumference now, would not see the same flow, depending if it's here, it's gonna see the ground vortex, and if your separation is big enough, you are going to have a distortion along this area. So in fact, for a fan blade, 
<clears throat> you get two types of distortion coming. One is due to crosswind. So you got a crosswind coming and the flow can separate here. And the other time that you get the flow distortion at the fan phase, is due to the, at the angle of attack operation during the takeoff because the flow air doesn't go clean inside the intake. So what does the fan see? So this is a, a, a picture of a crosswind. Let's forget the uh, cross the, the the ground vortex because ground vortex looks quite nice and it's more important for swallowing object, for foreign object damage. The real harm comes when you have a high enough crosswind, the lip separates. And when the lip separates, now if you look at the fan front on in this picture, you can see that as the fan goes around the circumference, it sees a different flow in front of it because you're gonna have a low pressure or low momentum flow at this area because of the air separating in this region. So consequently, the angle of attack, the incidence to the fan changes as it goes around the circumference. And now if you look at the, uh, we take a radius around 50% height and look at the instant, uh, the angle of attack of a, uh, around the circumference. So here we have circumference circumferential coordinate in the x-axis and we have the uh, incidence to the fan blade as the y-axis and you can see that as the fan goes around the circumference it obviously sees different incidence to it so consequently <clears throat> at the instant of the time each one of the fan blades in the assembly sees a different flow and so it would be operating at a different point on the operating map. So I try to plot it here. So we got mass flow against pressure ratio and take the red operating point. So this operating point defines the operating point of the whole assembly of the fan. So this corresponds to the whole 360 degrees operation. So this is the total operating point of the fan blade. However, if we look at individual fan blades, each one of them, each one of them would see a different flow and I have tried to plot each one of them <clears throat> around the circumference. So you can see that even though the total performance of the fan blade is at one point, So this is the operating point of the whole 360 degrees. But if you look at the performance of each fan uh, by itself, you can see that each one of them operates at a different operating point. So you can see some of them are running at a higher speed. Some of them are running at a lower speed. Some of them are more near the choke line and some of them are moved towards stall line. And this is due to the fact that due to the distortion, whether it's crosswind or angle of attack, the incidence around the circumference varies due to the, the distortion that we created. So consequently, you can see that now, if we look at the operating point further along the characteristic, the, this operating point, again, you have points nearer the choke condition, but you can see that you have some blades which are operating uh, behind the stall line. So consequently, you can imagine that if you have distortion, you would lose stall margin because some of the blades you be operating for some times behind the stall line. And the amount, uh, this way, you can think of it in another way. You can take one fan blade now, and this fan blade is rotating across the circumference. So instead of looking at the in theta, we are looking instead of what happens to one fan blade as it goes around the circumference. So first it goes to a higher speed, then it goes towards the stall line. 
it would operate around on the stall side for a bit then it goes back again towards the higher mass flow and so on so this is the operation of a fan blade as it goes around the circumference and you can see it that for that fan blade would experience a significant amount of forcing because not only is is running at changing his operating point from stall to choke higher to lower speed so the fan blade would experience a significant amount of forcing as it goes around the circumference and again as i showed you this forcing <clears throat> would be if we get the Fourier harmonics of this forcing now you can see that it would be func the frequency here are plotted as engine order which means per rev so this uh, unsteady forcing would have all the uh, frequencies of the rotation speed and if you have one of the natural modes of the blade has got a similar frequency to one of these uh, unsteady forcing, you are at resonance and you can see consequently, you expect a very high response value. And uh, this is a very, this is a simpler case because in some scenarios, this unsteadiness, this distortion is not really steady and becomes unsteady. So you would not only have the engine order response level, you would have frequencies which are between engine orders, but that's more complicated. I would not go through it. But one thing which is very noticeable, we go into the previous, uh, plot so apart from creating a significant amount of forcing and vibration the other thing that the crosswind or angle of attack would give you is a, a large loss in the stall margin of the blade and here we have looked at two blades one is the NASA rotor 67 which is a, a typical of an old design and this is your stall line without distortion and this is your stall line with distortion. You can see you have lost a significant amount of stall margin on, uh, by putting the distortion. This is the same thing for a modern low speed fan blade. And you can see that by increasing, by, uh, uh, we have plotted the stall. This is the case without any crosswind or distortion. This is the case with crosswind. And you can see by putting crosswind, you start losing a significant amount of stall margin again. And the other thing which is noticeable here, for the same amplitude of crosswind, you have more stall margin loss at a lower mass flow, because at lower speed, because the mass flow to the engine is smaller. So I think, oh, it's in half past. Uh, just to mention, for a fan blade, you got really two kinds of, uh, you have many kinds of distortion. So you have, uh, for crosswind, you have the inlet distortion, <clears throat> but also a fan blade would be mounted on the wing, and so it would have a big pylon behind it. So it would see also a distortion from behind. So a fan blade would experience a big distortion from behind during the pylon, and a big distortion from the front during the crosswind operation and angle of attack operation. Finally, just uh, this is to wrap up, uh, is for normal conventional aircrafts and uh, uh, engines, you would only see distortion when it is operating at angle of attack or crosswind condition but the thing is if you start going towards a type of boundary layer ingestion system so you will be sucking a boundary layer which might be going through s stock or not so but you would have a fan blade which would be seeing a distortion at all its operating condition so this uh, the problem of aeroelasticity becomes more important because your fan not only has to be tolerant to distortion during the crosswind condition as sea level static on the runway, but our takeoff, but it has to be tolerant to distortion all the way through the flight envelope because it would be experiencing distortion 
at all condition. And so this is a typical, you can see, I mean, we are looking at a modern engines in the future of civil engines. And you can see that we would have a sort of bundle layer adjustment is one of the conditions. So, or open fans, or oh, didn't go to open fans, but open fans potentially because there's no duct to protect them. Protect them. You can imagine that that crosswind operation or during takeoff would be seeing much more distortion due to the crosswind and angle of attack operation. And I'll just conclude that the fan blades in modern, uh, just as the conclusion of, about the elasticity, fan blades in modern high bypass air engine typically produce 80% of the thrust. And uh, to achieve, I think I talked about it, to achieve uh, significant improvement in fuel efficiency, new design concepts are required. One is the use ultra high bypass engines like is shown here. So I'm just trying to emphasize why air elasticity is important, not only for uh, unconventional new design, but even for conventional new designs that we are moving towards ultra high bypass ratio. Because <clears throat> what we are doing is we are putting bigger blade, fan blades here and ultimately to reduce the cost uh, weight and the drag penalty, we are using shorter intakes. So you can see that all the distortions that I showed in the previous slides, because your intake is shorter, does not have time to diffuse. So your separation could very much interact with the fan blade. And moreover, to reduce the weight, we are using lightweight composite fan blades. So you can imagine that we have more loaded fan blades with larger diameter, and also we have higher distortion uh, due to the, because we got shorter intakes and slimmer intake. So you can imagine that we are reducing the left-hand side of the equations of aeroelastic motion, but we are increasing the uh, right-hand side. So consequently, you expect the new design of the blaze to be more prone to aeroelastic instability. So, I think if we carry on designing engine like this, uh, there is still a lot of aeroelasticity and aeroelastic uh, problems to be expected. Thank you for listening to me and sorry for going over time. Thanks a lot for the very interesting and uh, very well, uh, uh, very clear presentation. So um, actually we, we already have a question in uh, which I will report. Uh, maybe you can uh, you can ask you can uh, you can reply to that. Um, the question I is the report actually because I put it uh, away. Uh, you, you, uh, that's that's a question which I received in uh, as a private yeah. message. So I think you you. You don't have it, but okay. I can I can report it. I can uh, I can uh, I can tell you what's the question. So uh, uh, the participant asks concerning the part of the talk of the, of the tip leakage flow. Does the effect of the machine engine and the associated increase of the tip gap has to be taken into account? Um, uh, as it could have an impact on the tip leakage dynamics and also. Uh, I imagine on the aeroelastic phenomenon. Yeah, it is very important. The tip leakage is very, uh, the size of tip leakage is very important because, first of all, it would uh, dictate the amplitude of the forcing. So, uh, how much forcing you get. So, your, your forcing would increase with increasing the tip leakage of the flow. The other phenomena that we have noticed that the frequency of the excitation is quite dependent on the 
amount of flow going from the pressure side to the suction side. And so hence the tip leakage flow determines not only the amplitude, but also the frequency of the unsteady forcing due to the tip leakage flow. So yeah, it is very important. So uh, it definitely needs to be considered. So uh, it's one of the major players in this type of instability, apart from the operating point. Okay, okay, thanks. Um... But the other factor is, as you before, as you increase your tip leakage flow, then uh, you increase your uh, tip gap size, your size of your tip leakage flow, you reach the zero slope much earlier because you lose stall margin. So you would reach that at a much higher mass flow. So yeah, tip leakage flow is very important in this type of analysis. Okay. Um, uh, then let's see if there is someone else who, who would like to ask a question. So to the participant, just feel free to unmute your mic and ask the question if you have any. Okay, then maybe I can uh, uh, I can ask you also uh, uh, one more question regarding the tip leakage flow as well, if it's um, if it's okay with you. Um, how does like the uh, the instab in, how can instabilities related to to tip leakage flow like spike instabilities can interact? with um, uh, instabilities of elastic nature and uh, uh, is there something which uh, uh, are there like uh, coupled ph phenomena which uh, are increasingly damaging the, the, the blades or the compressor related to the interaction of the two? Yeah, because I think usually uh whether you get a broadband signal on the tip instability or you get certain uh, frequency, if one of those uh, frequencies is sufficiently close to one of the natural frequencies of the blade, what happens is the frequency of the unsteadiness, the tip leakage vortex, next tends to move towards the frequency of the vibration. For, and Consequently, uh, this is a phenomenon which we call locking. So when you start, if you, uh, it's a very simple thing that as well, you can see it on an aerofoil. If you have an aerofoil and uh, you got vortex shedding going at many frequencies, <coughs> aerofoil at a very high angle of attack. And so you got free, uh, vortex shedding at going at many frequencies. If you start uh, moving your blade, at a frequency near one of the uh, frequencies of vortex shedding, what happens is it ha tends to happen is the frequency of the shedding tends to lock into the frequency of the vibration. And it would even uh, could change in nature so that the shape of the unsteadiness would look like the shape of the way you move your blade. So exactly the same thing could happen here that you have uh, uh, all of these uh, frequencies here. And as soon as you start moving the blade, the frequency of the, this unsteadiness would lock into the frequency of the vibration. I don't know whether you answered your question correctly or not. Yeah, yeah, that's very, that's very clear. That's very clear. I actually have, also uh, follow up if I if I may um, um, what uh, so um, within the same framework of uh, uh, instabilities that we are that we are considering um, how does the uh, effect of uh, flow compressibility uh, play because. I mean, we observe the spike instability already in, com in compressors which are running at uh, very low Mach numbers so that the, the, the origin of that instability is really related to the tip leakage flow and not much to the compre to compressible uh, effects. But on the other hand, 
when we have like uh, uh, compressors which are kind of running at uh, very high Mach yeah. number. Hmm? Yeah, they are transonic speeds. Yeah, and in that case, you may have an interaction of uh, shock waves with the instability. Can you comment on that? If there is well, uh, when you go transonic speed. This is obviously, as you can tell, this is a low speed compressor. Yeah. <clears throat> when you have a transonic plate, it, the situation becomes a bit more tricky because this tip leakage vortex on steadiness starts shaking the shock wave on the suction side of the blade. So consequently, you would get larger amplitude forcing. Even if we, first of all, the blade would be more loaded. So delta loading would be bigger because already the mean loading is bigger. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so a slightest change would give you a bigger change in loading. But the other thing which happens is you do not only have unsteadiness due to this vortex. You can see here the main effect uh, coming from the tip leakage vortex, <clears throat> it would affect the pressure side of the trailing blade. But when you have a shock wave, oh, oh, do, I'm not, oh, yeah, you can't see my arrow here. Correct? Yes, yes. When you have a shock wave sitting here with this tip leakage vortex flowing here, and breaking down, it tends to move the shock up and down. And that would give you quite a large amplitude in, in vibration and uh, potentially uh, could uh, give you an extra option for stalling the blade. Okay, so if we would like to compare somehow the phenomenology of a low speed compressor and the, and the high speed compressor, uh, we we cannot always do it. I mean, uh, actually, we... Uh... I think because if you uh, uh, think of it that if you have a, I don't know, the, if in terms of stalling, so you, if you think of it, if you have a shock wave sitting here, mm -hmm. you got this deep leakage water goes through the shock and after shock, is a, a behavior would become a bit different. Do you see my... Yeah. Uh, and also this is not, because of this unsteadiness, it's not gonna be sit, see, sitting at the same place because instantaneously we see a variation in the downstream flow and consequently yeah. it has to respond to the downstream. And so it starts shaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. I see basically one more frequency enters into play. That's the frequency of the displacement of, uh, of the shockwave. Yeah, and slide if you and then if you uh, look at your lift plot in terms of the uh, shock wave, so this is your uh, I'm plotting CP, so this is your shock wave sitting here. So if it moves slightly, say it goes upstream, you can see you gain and this amount of forcing is quite a lot because the slight movement of the shock gives you. In terms of air elasticity, it gives you quite a lot of force. Ah, uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. I see. I see. Thanks a lot. That's uh, uh, that was very clear. Um, let's see if someone else has some questions. So, um, to the participants, if you have any questions, just feel free to unmute your mic and ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I, thank you for a very interesting talk. I, I, I'm not a specialist, so we'll have a very general question. Uh, you show a lot of CFD results. So how sensitive is the results of the CFD uh, to, the, to the unsteadiness that you want to study, actually? So yeah. I see some DDS, for example. Uh, is it, uh, I mean, what is the requirement and where are you are sure that uh, your phenomena doesn't depend anymore on, uh, on the turbulence model and the uh, and the grid that you that you take into that you use? Uh, it's a very valid point because I think most of the time I try to emphasize that a lot of analysis we do are uh, qualitative rather than quantitative and. 
and would be, uh, I mean, CFT would be then, uh, it would be especially, they are not all DDS, some of them are even URANs. So it depends on your grid and so on. It's just trying to tell the story, how does it excite the play? But as for uh, modeling, we found out that uh, for vibration, DDS tends to be quite good because I suppose if you want to model noise, you want to model more structures because the, like a broadband noise, you will be interested in more, uh, resolving more, harm, more frequencies correctly. And so consequently you need a better model than DDS. But we found out that for vibration, in, we are only interested for, uh, we are mostly interested in the structures which tend to interact with the vibration. <clears throat> so consequently, uh, it could sort of, uh, so far the DDS doing for tip gap modeling uh, like that has been quite successful. But uh, as I said before, this is not going to be very good uh, approximation for noise, but for vibration, DDS so far has been quite successful for us. Okay. So, but yeah. most of the other things I showed you, as I show, show, said, they are URANs. We have used CFT, mostly try to explain the phenomena, how we get vibration rather than, than get a definite answer that this is the correct number. Okay, I understand. So this this is because uh, it's mostly the larger structures which uh, that you that are of, of interest actually to the to the unsteadiness. So this is why the DES can uh... do better for yeah. this type of flow. Yeah. Mm. For example, because when you start vibrating uh, a structure like that, then uh, you get these nice uh, structures like this then they are quite big. So they are going to be modeled quite nicely with DDS. Okay. Okay, thank you. So is, this, is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Just uh, once again, feel free to unmute your mic or uh, you can just write in the chat and uh, I can report the question. That doesn't seem to, okay. to be the case. So thank you once again for the, for the webinar you gave. It was uh, very, very interesting, very clear. Uh, I received uh, a number of uh, private uh, messages telling that uh, many participants, they were very <laughs> satisfied with the explanation. So uh, well, thanks. Hopefully. It's quite thanks. a difficult problem and I think uh, because you can see that you can get a uh, vibration due to acoustic as in this picture. Yes. You can get vibration due to unsteady flow like this picture, or you can have for a really even a nice flow, as I said, for just a pure flutter, you can have a nice flow, but due to shape of your vibration, characteristic, you can get large amplitude flutter. So it is a subject which requires all the knowledge of aerodynamics, mechanics, and acoustics in a way. Yeah, 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 that's, that's very true. And uh, so I invite the participant to thank you once again, and uh, I hope to, to see you all next, uh, next week. Uh, good evening. Bye. Bye.